Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to OLC TV for some more Total War Three Kingdoms, the Furious Wild DLC. And unfortunately, the 190 start date, because per ye, as I promised I would play after our previous campaign uh, with the previous patch failed um, due to update problems, um, I promised I'd play him again and finish the campaign. And uh, I wanted to do it with the 194 start date, but... Uh, Bastards aren't letting me. So we're going in for the 190 start date, which is my least favorite, but hey, what can you do? It'll be fun anyway. Um, <clears throat> so we're going in as her the yellow terms again. A little bit of history for those of you who weren't there uh, for the last playthrough. He Yi was actually a subordinate of Huang Shao. Um, and in this game, they've got him starting in 190 as a yellow turban remnant. That just isn't remotely accurate. Uh, Huang Shao and He Man together started to collect an army in the Runan and Yingchuan area uh, of China, which is sort of this area here. Um, and they were t supposed to be leading a huge yellow turban force to support Yuan Shu, who was based in this area here, for his upcoming fight against the likes of Liu Bei and Cao Cao and blah blah blah. But Cao Cao came in there and smashed them and He Yi was one of the leaders who surrendered after Huang Shao and Herman were defeated and executed. Um, they're supposed to have had, you know, a decent number of men under their command, like in the potentially tens of thousands, at least over 10,000 men. Um, they have a, a level of romantic mysticism over them based on Romance of the Three Kingdoms, um, with the likes of like Xu uh, Chu and Li Dian getting involved and capturing some of their leaders and that leading to Cao Cao executing them later. Um, that just really didn't happen. Li Dian did not capture Huang Shao, Xu Chu did not capture He Yi. He Yi surrendered with his men and what happened to him we don't know. Uh, Huang Shao was captured and killed. He Man was uh, captured and killed after being defeated. They also, and this is really important, had very little, if anything, to do with Gongdu. Gongdu did form a rebellion in this area, but Gongdu was very much more a bandit than a yellow turban. And I do have to say as well, like Huang Shao, He Yi, etc. They had sympathies with the yellow turban movement of the 184 AD led by Zhang Jue, Zhang Zhao, uh, depending which version of his name you go with. They never served under him. They were merely sympathetic towards it, and they were much more bandit than Yellow Turban. Like, the previous thing was a proper movement. They were certainly nothing like Zhang Lu as well, who was over in the West, actually where Gongdu sort of starts. Um, not in this one. Like, Gong, uh, Zhang Lu actually around this time was in, in deep into Shu, but eventually he would go up and take Hanzhong and set up his own sort of independent theocracy. But it's similar to the area where Gongdu was. Gongdu was very much a bandit. Huang Shao uh, and He Yi were very bandity, but a little bit more yellow turban -y than the likes of Gongdu, who was just pure bandit. Um, Gongdu as well was a, a one-time ally of Liu Bei, which of course you don't get um, in this at all. Anyway, we are going in as He Yi. Now He Yi has, because uh, he's the leader of the people, his place that focuses population. And this is one of the things that those of you who see me play, I I tend to focus on the army and, and sod the rest of it. So um, I'm going to need to work on that to really get the maximum out of him. His standing position is hard, but yeah, you know, everyone's at war with you, so be it. Um, he has increased replenishment, which is incredible. Um, because you know, the more people we have, especially, this really starts to boost us. And population increase as well will decrease our recruitment costs. So we can replenish troops really quickly if we keep our pop high. We have the Yosha, which actually Yosha is refers to a sort of knight errant type character. Uh, Liu Bei was said to have sort of consort, uh, consorted with Yosha when he was in his youth, fought with them, played with them, drank with them. Uh, Cao Cao as well, uh, Yuan Shao as well, Yuan Shu as well. Like this was something that that the noble classes were. They used as a sort of a derogatory term, but these these were people who like braves, young, arrogant, violent braves, and we get them as the yellow turbans. We also get a village healer, which will improve uh, pop growth and public order, which is magnificent. We will aid the wounded, which is an occupation growth as well, which is very very nice. We have Herman, the most powerful, um, who was of course a senior commander under Huang Shao, 
Um, so of course Hei gets him because you know they need to split up the yellow turban leaders. There aren't that many known, um, really. A lot of them would just kill or disappeared into the wilderness or switch sides very very quickly after the main leaders were beaten so we don't know a huge amount of detail about all of the yellow turban subordinates so they split them up across where they were like Jiang Kai for example for whatever reason ends up with Gong Du a lot of the time what he's doing over there who knows he worked for Tian Kai uh, for Tao Qian sorry so you know <clears throat> uh, Hai is a disciplinarian, he's kind, he's relentless, he's a healer as well, which means uh, he's pretty good at inf uh, inspiring troops and fighting at range, but less good in melee. Actually, Hai is not too bad himself, but other healers are not all that great. Um, and Hai sees the mandate of heaven passing from the Han and knows it is time to pick up the mantle of the Yellow Turn Rebellion and lead them in righteous revolution. He believes most ardently that if the Taiping Jing, the way of great peace, declares that the land must be purified of evil, then he will be the instrument that delivers the purification. The old dynasty will be purged by war, and He Yi will see the yellow sky rise over a field of blood. It's a, it's a good write-up. It's a good write-up for someone who actually did pretty little historically. But anyway, it's going to be fun. Um, quick notes about how I'm going to be playing this. Just on the old uh, option mode here. Battle difficulty legendary, campaign difficulty on very hard got ourselves auto save i'm not going to do timeless characters i quite like it when they die it adds a level of of of, of difficulty to it um reducing all of this stuff just to keep it as simple as possible battle realism mode, mode sorry i do quite like that and as well just a note i as a bandit leader as a yellow turban rebellion um of sorts i am going to be going in hard on the governors so, of course, we have warlords and governors as part of the Han. And now, of course, we've got the tribes as well. And we've got bandits. Now, bandits are going to treat as a sort of neutral entity. I do think CA has fucked up with how this works with the bandits. I believe that the Yellow Turbans should be able to recruit and have diplomatic ties with the bandits. Historically, of course, they should have been able to do whatever they wanted with anyone because people are a lot more practical than a game will allow. But for the sake of fun, I understand why they restrict their gameplay. But I think they should have a lot more of a relationship with the bandits than they actually do in game. Um, but I'm going to be treating the bandits as neutral and I'm going to be treating the warlords as a sort of hostile neutral faction in recognition of the fact that He Yi actually supported Yuan Shu. Yuan Shu. Now this does not mean that I'm going to be giving Yuan Shu a break. If the opportunity comes, I'm going to slap him into next week. That's just the way it's going to go. But the governors are Han. right? The warlords are out for themselves. The governors are Han. And so the warlords, I'm going to treat with a little bit of respect. That means I'm not necessarily going to execute everyone who comes into my land. The governors, however, they're in for violence. And that is how we're going to play this. Right. Let's get into the game. Huo 天下早已改其意志 主公，即使腹背受敌，你也要结束他们的苦难。我等之大义，乃汉之末路。若不坚守，必将大败。我等寡不敌众，孰可战，孰不可战，万望深思。唯一守住这次来犯，方可对汉室发起反击。
Okay, so here we are. Establish our power, He Yi. The tyrant has thrown China into even greater chaos. Heaven has abandoned the Han. We must lead the Yellow Turbans to claim the Mandate of Heaven and restore peace. Yet the Han still has might, so you must not travel recklessly into the fray. We are outnumbered, so we must build our strength gradually, consolidate the nearby commanderies, defeat any Han loyalists who oppose you, enjoy their onslaughts, then strike. The Yellow Sky will rise. Claim Han Empire regions and be wary of Liu Biao and his vassals. He Yi seeks to prove the Yellow Turban cause is just in battle. Enemy forces are encroaching our lands from all sides. The situation is dire and the flame of rebellion is all but extinguished. You must consolidate your forces and fight only the battles you must. So, we need to smash baby's first battle and get a lovely spear. Through study and reform, greater heights are achieved. Without the eternal reason, we are powerless. Study three books, for the wisdom contained therein will strengthen us and could help us turn the tide of conflict. So gain the book of people for He. Let's have a look here. Stone horse, local administrator, and the more Z. Interesting. Right. So we have Herman and Guada. So Herman was, of course, a. <clears throat> I mean, he actually was a bandit leader um, in the Runan Yinchuan area, where specifically we don't know exactly. Um, and he, uh, of course, became a serious subordinate under Huang Shao. Now. What happened to him in detail is very hard to say. Ultimately, what happened is Cao Cao led a punitive expedition in the region, smashed their army, and he was executed. Romance of the Three Kingdoms has a lot more in it. He is eventually killed by Cao Hong, and he's nicknamed the Shooting Devil or something like that. It's supposed to be extremely good with archery, which is why he has a bow in this. That's all fictitious. Um, he may well have been good at archery, but that's not what's written down um he is literally just a casualty name a named casualty in the book of way uh we also have <laughs> guo da or big guo um who was uh, actually a leader of the white wave bandits um and claimed affiliation with the yellow turbans the white wave bandits uh were i mean they actually come from xi he region which is sort of around here if we're looking um, on the map, yeah, he comes from around there um, in Bing province, Bingzhou, which is up here, which is where uh, Ding Yuan, Lu Bu, etc. were uh, from. Um, they came south, uh, ravaged Taiyuan, Hedong. Basically, they just burnt everything and destroyed everything all the way down to here. Um, and uh, Gordon people sort of go missing after that. We don't really know what happened to them. Um, I was trying to find a little bit more about him, but basically his name seems to have disappeared. The White Wave Bandits, however, have quite an extensive uh, bit of history added onto this, where they support the Emperor escaping from Chang'an all the way to Luoyang. They battle a little bit with Cao Cao as well. Their leaders flee. They have a little bit of time as mercenaries doing stuff in this general region before they are eventually captured and killed by Liu Bei over in Xu province. Gorda is not mentioned through any of that time. We know that there was infighting within the White Wave Bandits, so maybe he was one of the casualties of that infighting. Who knows? But we have him, so cool, I guess. Really that cool. But we need to hand out all of our little uh, trophies. What do we have here? You're an administrator um here you can go to him because extra arrows and stuff could be quite useful we got nothing for you on the old followers front instinct resolve all this can definitely go to you for now which means oh man no sorry Gorda, you can have this for fun uh no horses none of this and none of this unfortunately we've got maracas though so good old maracas is there Right, so this is our current situation. We've got Baby's first battle here against Zhao Zhe. Because why not? Why, why not pick a random name to beat up? And we've got Zhang Hu down here as well. Um, on this front, we get bonuses from population. We need enlightenment as well, because enlightenment will knock us up different levels uh, different in, in, in the social standing. And eventually when we reach proper enlightenment, that's when we can deal like human beings with the rest of the world. 
So it's quite useful. Satisfaction is very, very nice indeed. Character experience is very nice. White wave soldiers. I do like the white wave soldiers. Pop growth will is really our thing. I love soldiers. I love campaign movement range too. I really love campaign movement range. But I know if I do campaign movement range, I'm not gonna I'm gonna forget about the population growth. Because I always forget about population growth. But campaign movement range. Okay, so we've got campaign movement range. Um and we can definitely up this. That'll be all of our cash. Not sure if we want to spend all that money. We've got a decent army here with Herman. By decent, I mean it's relatively small, but they're solid. We've got yellow turban warriors, which are good. He's got militia of virtue, which won't break really well. And the yellow sky heralds, which just really don't break. So, um, you know, they're not bad. Here we've got the Yosha. We've got the People's Warband, who are all right early game, I guess. And the yellow turban archers, which is surprisingly good. We're going to fight baby's first battle. We're up against some G militia. Um, so, yeah. Let's go smash these guys into next week. It's going to be a good fight. Let's get into it. Okay. <clears throat> so, here we are. Uh, we've got Vanguard deployment for the Osha, but we're not going to need any tricks for this. This is pretty straightforward. Bring everyone back here. Take them off um, skirmish mode. We're going to take them off guard as well. And let's just go for it. So a quick look at our boys just before we go in to fight these people. These are the Yosha here. Uh, decent leather armor. Nice shield. They've got a gen sword as well by the looks of it. They're all right. Hoi of course, with his spear on top and his cool hat. Here are our people's warband. Leather armor. Jewel... They look like dual uh, dowels to me, the ring pommel dowels, which are really quite brutal weaponry, frankly. These guys as well, the archers, they've got a ring pommel dow and bows uh, with a little bit of leather armor. All in all, they're a pretty well equipped force. Now, these fools, whilst we've been chatting, are coming to play. So let's get our traps thrown out earlier. I'm always criticized for not using enough. Uh, no, Zaldra can go do one. Um, I could beat Zaldra. Right? I could. What's the point, though? I want to keep my health up and ready. So, um, we will wait. We will wait. <clears throat> um, so, uh, one of the things I've been doing recently in between work is actually helping my brother. My brother is, makes tabletop games. He's a rules designer for tabletop games. And one of the things we have been doing because of lockdown and uncertainty of jobs and all the rest in his free time he's been making a, uh, a tabletop game um 15 millimeter tabletop game <clears throat> for three kingdoms getting models design all the rest and i've been helping him with the uh, history making sure that the troops are relatively historically accurate you know all of that stuff oh shit they've moved over here um and so we've been getting really into actually how they fought which was something that interested me anyway but i had always mostly focused on the northeast, and for this, for the case of uh, this uh, setup, what I needed to do was actually thought, think about China overall. And we've been speaking to some some experts in the area, certainly some traditional weapon uh, masters. We need you to shift all the way around there so we avoid our own trap. Um, the likes of like LK Chen who make uh, replica swords and stuff like that and there's some armor designers in China as well using some of the old contacts and the old language skills and all the rest just to chat to people make sure that we've got the right stuff I'll do some of that just to make sure things are going the right way um, to talk about it and just to discuss how fighting changed you absolute pansy people's warband come back here um here, you come back here as well. Pin this guy. You kill them. Let's just keep shit going here. Um, you know, just to see how people fought and everything else at the time. And it's, it's quite fascinating. I, I knew a fair bit already. But most of my ideas were based on cavalry and the nomads and fighting the cavalry and, and things like that. I saw infantry battles and the like. I knew a bit, but, you know... I now know a hell of a lot more. And we were focused on like the G, because you see a lot of G infantry um, on the TV shows and of course in this game, like all these dead bodies knocking around here, they have the G. Now, for one thing, this G that they have, 
Um, and I'm just going to stay away from this because we know the battle's won. This G that they have here is not historically accurate to the period. This is a much earlier um, form of G. The hand G, the spear point end was attached very differently. It wasn't uh, part of this setup here to the um, uh, to the shaft, and they fought in these very weird, sort of very quick, choppy actions um, in formation to create maximum damage, have maximum effect uh, when they were uh, fighting their battles, and. Um, yeah, like, it, it, it became more and more out of fashion because the G was, although versatile and useful, it required a level of skill, it required a level of training, uh, which the spear didn't require. The spear was also cheaper to make. So as time went on, people moved further and further away from the G and into using the spear more and more and more. It's the same with the Gen. Now, we've seen... Uh, we've got our boys in here uh, with the Yosha. They have a Gen. It's the double-bladed sword like two-edged sword whilst our other chaps here have the ring pommel dao and the ring pommel dao single-edged sword that became infinitely more popular amongst uh and we'll do a little bit more of this um infinitely more popular amongst that was brutal <laughs> um amongst soldiers over time because it was cheaper to produce and there was this chinese saying that it took a year to train someone to use a uh, gen but it took a week to train someone to use a dao so it just became a lot quicker and cheaper and more effective to use it. Um, and yeah, learning all about that has been absolutely fascinating. And also the fact that troops just got heavier and heavier armoured over this period. And you see it, like the rise in cataphracts, horse armour, which are the beginning. Horses are a sort of auxiliary, we'll take replenishment, sort of this auxiliary unit that have you know, skirmishing capabilities. You know, they... Uh, I got a lovely spear. Um, fantastic. Hi, you six talented warriors to help lead the rebellion. We need a yellow turban spear, Captain. Oh, bollocks, I hate those. Hi, you moves to prove the strength of the yellow turbans. Captain, occupy any settlement. We shall try our best. Um, let me just change this out. There we go. Uh, we've changed that. And I think... I think we're going to... Push up here a tiny bit. We're gonna. Uh, am I just out of. Uh, uh, uh. Can't recruit this turn, but we'll stay right there for uh, purposes of uh, replenishment. You chaps. We can't beat them in a straight fight. These guys here, they have. a pretty. We might be able to beat them. We might be able to beat them. What do you think? We might be able to beat them. We might be able to beat them. Let's uh, let's give this a go. Let's give this a go. But yeah, like the the cavalry at the beginning were much more skirmish based. They were uh, they they had like light crossbows or they were trained archers and they didn't wear much armor and they'd ride up and they'd harass and pepper and ride away and harass and pepper and ride away they might even fight on foot if they needed to but later on especially when you get to people like the tiger and leopard cavalry you're my favorite unit they were heavy armored um they grew more heavily armored over time of course like in the early days right at the beginning Sasa didn't have the money um to provide uh, his tiger and leopard with like serious uh, heavy armor for their horses like the soldiers themselves they may well have had better than just you know the the standard um, what's it armor the the standard uh, leather armor that uh, decent units had at the time they may well have had iron rivets or even potentially steel rivets for for some of the higher ranked guys um, but the majority um, of the time their troops would have had what was available to them and that meant that they didn't have a huge amount of armor as time went on however boy did they get heavy they got heavy armor they got heavy everything and they began to absolutely rip people apart like weight of cavalry charge and all the rest oh, let's fire this off in here do your thing do it do it do what are you doing you pillock <sighs> I don't know what he's doing. But he's having fun, and that's all that matters, right? 
All right, you chaps, come over here. Out you come, boy. Out you come. Come on, you don't need to be in there. Come on, come on. There's a good boy. Come on, the most powerful. Be less of a tit. Out here. And let's ping these people, please. Please, please, please. There we go. That's it. That's the stuff. Brilliant job. Right, now get in there and thump the shit out of them. Right, you chaps, advance. And you and you are coming over here. Excellent. Good job. Slashy, slashy, smashy, smashy. Keep them on the run, if you don't mind. You and you, come take that hill. You charge. You... Yeah, take that flank. There we go. We'll take the hill. He can just chase them off. We don't need to worry about them too much. We'll mop up whatever's left in the town. Um. Yeah. He is, yeah, ripping them. A new asshole. And uh, for all of those who said <laughs> when I first played as uh, Her Yi, said I wasn't uh, using him correctly, you were right. I know how to... Uh, sorry, Herman. I know how to use Herman. I just... You don't need to half the time. His presence alone does a lot of damage. But if you can get these uh, lovely hail of arrows off, they rip them to shreds. We're going to try it again on this fuckwit here. G Infantry Captain, a little bit heavier than usual. Throw. Throw. Rip them apart. They don't have shields. And ready, boom. You boys, you better move. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. Good, right. I doubt they're coming back. Uh, all of you lot over here. Uh, decline, thank you. You and you over here. We'll take this off. So yeah, like I, I find the warfare and the battles of the infantry a lot more interesting than I did before. Cavalry always interested me, like the speed, the range, the stamina, how they kept going for days, all of that was always fascinating. The, the equipment they had to take with them, the baggage trains had to be fast moving, um, especially like Gong Suzanne because he revolutionized how they dealt with it. He has such a bad reputation um, because, of course, a lot of it was deserved. Um, he was this brutal frontier commander who really mistreated people who were only doing their job. And he betrayed uh, Liu Yu. Though so their relationship's a little bit more complicated than that. But you can say, like, he he was a subordinate of Liu Yu. And he just plain did not do as he was told. Um, upset Liu Yu. Completely caused chaos in his home province. You know, he, he really upset the apple cart in his home province. Um, but he, he did completely revolutionise the way how... Uh, the hand dealt with the bandit, uh, so the, the marauding uh, nomadic tribesmen in the area. He completely revolu re revolutionized it. He was brilliant. He was a brilliant cavalry commander. Um, his problems came when he was fighting against Han Chinese, not when he was fighting against the Wuhan and the Xianbei. Um, he was extremely intelligent, uh, led numerous campaigns, but he always overreached himself. And that was partly, though not solely, down to how he equipped his troops. He wanted light, fast, quick-moving troops that weren't, weren't supposed to be out for very long. He couldn't maintain the baggage trains. When a Han army traditionally went north to fight against the tribes, they had these huge wagon trains that they would then form into a sort of mobile wall whenever a steppe army would appear um, that they could then position their, their archers behind and shoot out and so that the uh, step nomadic cavalry couldn't really gain an advantage through harassing the troops. Um, and it became you know, like this mobile fortress moving across the land. Bong Sun did not do that. He didn't have those resources. He had a much smaller group of men that would go in and hunt down the uh, enemy leader and see if they could take him out in a fell strike. It was really quite brilliant, really quite clever. But of course, didn't work against Yuan Shao because he did try and do something relatively similar. Um, in one of his earlier battles against Yuan Shao. Uh, he was successful in that battle, of course. But uh, later on against Jie Chao, he was overconfident. He got thumped. Um, 
So yeah, I've been learning a lot about that, trying to get a lot more detail, speaking to some academics and uh, going over all of my old history books and stuff like that so that my brother can put this game together that we've been just mucking about with over lockdown and everything else. It's been really interesting. But I will be putting some more videos out based on the history and everything else because as I've been doing the research, I have been putting together all of the scripts and the videos. So my fact-based videos will be coming back very very soon so please look out for those those of you who were interested before i haven't forgotten about them um, let's speed this up these guys are now yep they're dead you chase you thump in the back you're chasing him off shame he escapes doesn't really matter though gonna come in here excellent job nicely done just a little bit of extra death while we can. That's really not going that great with the old death toll. Um, what about you guys? Yeah, that'll do. I can't be bothered anymore. Heroic victory. It wasn't really that difficult, to be fair. <sighs> like, I know sometimes when it says Peric victory, you're generally going to get a Peric victory. Um, and sometimes, like, depending how you f fight it, you can do much worse or much better than what they say, but these early battles when you've got a decent commander it's just especially a fighting commander if you've got a strategist it's different but if you've got a fighting commander you just break people in the early game that's all there is to it aid recruitment excellent off you fuck my man we're going in here um right and uh, i think ladies and gentlemen that is where i'm going to leave it for this episode in the next episode we're going to be going in and taking uh this town uh, Xiang as quickly as possible and then we're going to be expanding our army and trying to go in and uh, take some of this Hanland around us. I'll see you then. Bye bye.